Hello and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. A link to the Praying with Teresa of Avila website has been provided below to enable you to find the catalog of offerings on this channel and the notes of today's presentation, The Seventh Dwelling Places, Chapter 2, A Summary, Interior Castle, by St. Teresa of Avila. Continues on the same subject, explains the difference between spiritual union and spiritual marriage, describes this difference through some delicate comparisons. Now let us deal with the divine and spiritual marriage. This great favor does not come to its perfect fullness on earth. For if we were to withdraw from God, this blessing would be lost. The first time the favor is granted, His Majesty desires to show Himself to the soul through an imaginative vision of His most sacred humanity. The Lord represented Himself to her just after she had received communion in the form He was after His resurrection. He told her that now it was time that she consider as her own what belonged to him, and that he would take care of what was hers. At other times the Lord had represented himself to her, but this experience was so different that it left her stupefied and frightened, first because the vision came with great force, second because of the words the Lord spoke to her, and also in the interior of her soul, where he represented himself to her. She had not seen other visions. It's important to understand that there is a difference between all the previous visions and those of this dwelling place, between the spiritual betrothal and the spiritual marriage, the difference is great. It should be understood that in this state there is no more thought of the body than if the soul were not in it. One's thought is only of the spirit. The spiritual marriage is a secret union that takes place in the very interior center of the soul, which must be where God himself is. And in my opinion, there is no need of any door for him to enter. All that has been said up until now seems to take place by means of the senses and the faculties. But that which comes to pass in the union of the spiritual marriage is, is very different. The Lord appears in the center of the soul, not in an imaginative vision, but in an intellectual one as he appeared to the apostles without entering through the door when he said to them, Pax Vobis, peace be with you. What God communicates here to the soul in an instant is a secret so great and a favor so sublime and the delight the soul experiences so extreme that I don't know what to compare it to. I can only say that the Lord wishes to reveal the glory of heaven. The soul, I mean the spirit, is made one with God. He has desired to be so joined with the creature that he doesn't want to be separated from the soul. The spiritual betrothal is different, for the two often separate. The union is also different. Though it is the joining of two things into one, the two can be separated. We observe this ordinarily. The favor of union passes quickly, and the soul remains without that company. In spiritual marriage, no. The soul always remains with its God in that center. Let's say that union is like the joining of two wax candles to the extent the flames from both become one. But one candle can be easily separated from the other. In spiritual marriage, the union is like rain falling from the sky into a river or font, 
all is water. The rain from heaven cannot be separated from the water of the river or a stream entering the sea. There is no way of separating the two. Or bright light entering a room through two different windows, the two streams of light become one. The state is the place where the little butterfly dies and with the greatest joy because its life is now Christ. Its life in Christ is better understood with time by the effects. The soul understands clearly that God gives it life. It is understood that there is someone in the interior depths who shoots these arrows and gives life to this life, and that there is a sun in the interior of the soul from which a brilliant light proceeds and is sent to the faculties. The soul does not move from the center, nor is its peace lost. For the very one who gave peace to the apostles when they were together can give it to the soul. It has understood, it has occurred to me that this greeting of the Lord must be more than is apparent from its sound. The Lord's words are affected in us as deeds. It is very certain that in emptying ourselves of all that is creature and detaching ourselves from it, the Lord will fill us with himself. All of us are included here, his majesty said. I ask not only for them, but for all those who also will believe in me. And he says, I am in them. The words of Christ Jesus cannot fail. But since we fail by not disposing ourselves and turning from what hinders this light, we do not see ourselves in this mirror that we contemplate where our image is engraved. To return to what we were saying, the Lord puts the soul in this dwelling place of his, which is the center of the soul, where there are none of the movements that usually take place in the faculties and the imagination and do harm to the soul. It seems I am saying that when the soul reaches this state, it is sure of its salvation and safe from falling again. I do not say such a thing. And if I speak so to suggest the soul is secure, it means that as long as the divine majesty keeps it in his hand and it does not offend him. I know the soul does not consider itself safe, though it sees itself in this state. Rather, it goes about with much greater fear than before, guarding itself from any small offense against God. It also has the strongest desire to serve him and habitual pain and confusion at seeing the little it can do. The pain is no small cross, but a very great penance. The true penance comes when God takes away the soul's health and strength for doing penance. The pain is much more intense here. What is there to marvel at in the desires this soul has since its true spirit has become one with the heavenly water? To return to what I was saying, it should not be thought that the faculties, senses, and passions are always in this peace. The soul is, yes, but in those other dwelling places, times of war, trial, and fatigue are never lacking. However, they do not take the soul from its place and its peace as a rule. The center of our soul, or the spirit, is difficult to explain. I do not know how to explain it that there are trials and sufferings and the soul is in peace is a difficult thing to explain. 
I want to make one or more comparisons for you. I know I am speaking the truth. The king is in his palace. There are many wars in his kingdom and many painful things going on. Yet the king does not fail to be at his post. Although there is a lot of noise heard and many poisonous creatures in other dwelling places, no one enters the center dwelling place and makes the soul leave. Even though they cause it pain, the suffering is not enough to disturb it and take away its peace. The passions are now conquered, and fear entering the center for fear of being subdued. Our entire body may ache, but if the head is sound, the head will not ache. I laugh to myself at these comparisons, for they do not satisfy me, but I don't know any others. What I have said is true. Amen.